Welcome, folks, to a new and exciting adventure here on Rock Show Critiques page here. And uh, today uh, we got a, another normal special guest here. Well, the usual guy that's always here with me, none other than Mr. <laughs> uh, Tom Jennings. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to me. Yes. Welcome all here, again. <laughs> here, here. Here, here. Thank you. Here, here. And there you go. And that's that's what we're here for. <laughs> Yes, it is. Yes. So go ahead and give us the rundown on our new uh, segment episode here that we're just, this is the debut episode. Well, just a, a concept you know, back, back when I was a young, young lad, as I'm sure you were a young lad too, probably around our, our high school years. I, I remember album listening was a very communal experience and some of the albums that that are my favorites to this day are albums that a friend said, "Here, listen to this. This is this is great stuff. I think you'd really like it." And so, uh, as the world has become less, you know, when you get a, when you get a little older, you don't have that time where you just sit around smoking cigarettes, drinking beer, listening to records together. Uh, and in fact, in my day, we used to we used to shut off. I don't know if you ever did this, Joey, but we used to shut off the, the TV sound during like football games and baseball games and just listen to records while we watched the sports contest because we just love to listen to music that much. I tried that with my wife a few years back. She's like, no, we're not doing that ever again. But anyhow, uh, yeah, so it's just an opportunity to kind of expose each other to some new music. And, and for those of you out there that are listening, maybe you'll find something in the process that you can call your new favorite. And they say, you know, after age, I think 35, it becomes very difficult to find new music that you like. So this is an exercise uh, in determining whether that is indeed a fact or not. So there you go. All right. Yeah, it was an interesting concept. I enjoyed it. Um, definitely gives you, you know, opens your eyes perhaps to some more music that you never would have otherwise possibly heard. And, right. that's, and the, that's, and the cri criteria is if we give each other a record, it can't be one we've already heard because that would defeat the purpose. So, for instance, those of you that know anything about my background or Joey's background, we we have a core group of favorite musicians. So I'm obviously not going to give him a uh, White Snake album, and he's probably not going to give me a Utopia record because those are a couple of our favorite bands. But, yeah, we're trying to find stuff that the uh, the other one would like and uh, discuss it maybe some obscure stuff maybe some not so obscure stuff you never know i mean technically you could give me a white stick album because i don't know that i've ever <laughs> listened to a full one but that's a whole other story all right sounds good so for our first episode uh, first uh i threw tom um an artist from tampa florida named john wesley and uh, the album that i threw him was the debut album for uh, John, and that was none other than Under the Red and White Sky that came out in 1994. So tell us what you thought of the album. Yeah, it, it was it, it was interesting. Now, uh, uh, to, to be fair, it, this, this wasn't available on Spotify or Amazon Music. And I've already told Joey we're never doing that again because I just it's like uh, trying to listen to music on YouTube when it's not when you don't have a premium subscription. You got to go through all the ads and kind of all that other stuff. So that inhibited the the initial listen. But. I understood why you gave it to me. There's uh, there's definitely some prog elements, and I did a little digging. It looked like he's involved with uh, Porcupine Tree, and then that Stephen Wilson is in that band, and he's done all these remixes for Yes, and of course, you know, I'm a Yes fan and that kind of stuff. So he seems to be in my, uh, my wheelhouse, so to speak. Um, vocally, very interesting. I, I found at times... It, we were actually discussing, you know, a member of the Google Dolls before we came, before we started recording. And at times he has this vocal qualities that, you know, sometimes he sounds like Lawrence Gowan. Sometimes he sounds like John Resnick. Um, sometimes he sounds like Ray LaMontagne. And, and to some degree, I think he was, a, he may have been a little bit ahead of his time because he does kind of have that sort of, I don't know, Ray LaMontagne type quality. Is that, is that anything you picked up on or am I just off into to left field? Well, I'm not familiar with Ray. <laughs> so that would throw well, that under the bus for me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, kind of a lot of complexity. The music's a little bit dreary at, at points. Uh, 
one of the one of the I mean, there was a couple of, of songs that I really liked. Uh, the, my favorite one was uh, "Rome Is Burning." That was oh, that go. one. I really liked that one. I think there was a there was a lot going on there. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think this song is what you really want. And when it when it first started playing, I thought he was covering "Drive" by the Cars. It literally has the the exact same intro. Did you notice that? No. <laughs> but I'll, I'll admit. We, I mean, we we may have to bring it up. I mean, it is it is like it is so close. I I had to like I was like, what? It, you know, I mean, when I heard it, the intro was was almost exactly. That was one of the songs on the album that I never really got into. Um, you know, I mean, there's there, to me that like the beginning part of that album, like the first eight, nine songs is really where that album really is good. And then near the end of it, it kind of tails off from my liking of it. So I'm not, I wasn't really familiar with that one uh, because I never really get that far. I usually stop at Rome is burning and, <laughs> and man, that's a great eight songs though. When you get done with that. Uh, so so, he, so usually... he's, he's somebody that you've seen live before. Oh yeah, he he was he's known more more or less as the main opener for Marillion whenever they toured in the North America. He would he would open up the shows, and um, so from like about ninety two till about mid two thousands because they didn't play over here pretty much after two thousand five until just within the last ten years they barely got over here once or twice. So. Yeah, and then he's toured with a lot of people. Right now, he's actually touring with Vertical Horizon. He's been in. Uh, he's did a lot of work with Mike Tramp from White Lion. Uh, he played with Fish, the former singer of Merlion. He played on a couple of his uh, tours and, and stuff. So when you say Fish, it's Fish with an F. It's not P right. H I S H. Yeah, the real Fish, Derek Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Back to the edited version. Um. <clears throat> yeah, but it it is it is amazing how often uh, these days you'll find a record like this one, which is which is so obscure that you can't really find it on any major streaming platforms like Spotify, Amazon Music, you know, things like that, which is rare these days. Most of the time, this stuff is pretty easy, uh, easily found. So uh, that was that was some of the frustration behind it. But I'm glad you shared it with me. I mean, it's. Uh, it's definitely an album that's in my wheelhouse per se. I don't know. I don't know that I buy a copy of it, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, if it, if it was out on vinyl, but I'm assuming if this is 1993 and it's not on streaming platforms, it's probably not a, a vinyl version of it. Yeah. I mean, that was about the time when most people were just releasing things on CD instead of vinyl and stuff that was in the mid nineties. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. And, yeah. And it, it it's um the the mix is a little it's the vocals are a little bit hot in the mix too. I think there's uh and the drum I wasn't a big fan of the drums. I didn't like the drums. So yeah, I think the drums um let's see. I mean there was something they sound they sound programmed, which is weird. I mean, yeah, and that, it could that could have been um because he's working with Mark and Paul Prater, who we, who we previously worked with before in other bands, so s some of that could have been pre-programmed. Um, yeah, but the cool well, thing it, about it, this album it, that you probably weren't aware of was that Steve Rothery from Marillion actually plays um, on the album on the solo on Thirteen Days, and uh, Ian Mosley, the drummer from Marillion, plays on two tracks himself, and Mark Kelly plays keyboards throughout the whole album. From Marillion, yeah, so. yeah, was he? It was like he was like a was he a guitar tech for Marillion or something? Is that what yeah. I read? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So yeah. there's a big connection there with the prog, like you said. You know, yeah, that, definitely prog. Yeah, I mean, I I see why he gave it to me. I think if you're a fan of, obviously, if you're a fan of Marillion, you're a fan of Porcupine Tree, some of that later proggy type stuff. It's not a super. It's not a super prog album. I mean, it's more uh, singer it's songwriter. Kind of singer songwriter meets prog. You know, it does mm -hmm. really remind me of some of the more modern day, you know, like Ray LaMontagne or uh, trying to think of somebody else along those lines. But, yeah, that kind of uh, kind of like 
emotional, lots of layers to it, you know, almost new age type sounding, but yeah. All right. So there but you have he's, it. If he's listening, put, put it out on Amazon music and Spotify, earn yourself a nickel for every thousand plays. Come on, do it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, go ahead and uh, tell them what you did, what you wanted me to listen to here. Yeah. So I gave you squeezes East side story. And uh, the reason I found squeeze in a very, very weird way. Come to think of it. I don't know if I've ever told you this story. I probably haven't, but Mm -mm. I used to work at a nightclub in Rochester called the red Creek Inn, And I, uh, there was a, one of the standup comedians was the morning disc jockey on WCMF, which was the local radio station. He was one of the co-disc jockeys. His name was BJ Shea. And BJ uh, was performing and he says, uh, he says, oh, I got uh, I got two two tickets to see Mike and the Mechanics at the Rochester Auditorium Theater. And, you know, do you want to go with your wife or girlfriend or whatever at the time? I'm like, sure. So he gave me the tickets and I went and saw Mike and the Mechanics. And I was like, holy mackerel, these guys are phenomenal. And uh, only at that point did I did I kind of make the connection between, you know, Mike and the Mechanics, uh, Paul Carrick and and tempted and how long and you know paul carrick's one of those guys who just had so many different things uh going on and uh that record's just absolutely incredible so i started listening to uh around that time started listening to to some squeeze so i found that east side story album which is the one i gave you and then a, on the follow-up which is uh sweets from a stranger is also one of my favorites and Another band of that era that was kind of similar was Split Ends, and eventually they broke off into a Crowded House. But nevertheless, I think of all the Squeeze albums, even though Carrick only sings one song on this one, uh, I think it's the best. It's just they're you know they got country on it, they've got uh, they've got pop. Just the songs are really cleverly written, and uh, the vocals are great. And it's just in terms of you know to me in terms of like. Um, of like, you know, bands out of England. I, I think that uh, Squeeze certainly there was a there was a period of time where people were touting them as the next Beatles, and this is the kind of album that really started that kind of chatter. I mean, it really was a great album from beginning to end, and produced by who was it produced by? Uh, a couple Mr. guys. One guy named Roger Bakrian. Bic- Not sure if I'm pronouncing that one right. And of course, a guy by the name of. Mr. Elvis Costello. Elvis has not left the building. No, he was in the building. <laughs> yes, Mr. Elvis Costello. So there you go. That's what, uh, you know, Labeled with Love is to me one of the, the the best songs ever written. Just such a just a great country song on so many levels. And, uh, of course, Tempted is just a huge hit as well. So what you think? All right. So let's <laughs> dig right in, roll up the <laughs> sleeves, and get to work on this garb. No. <laughs> Anyhow, uh so uh, the only thing I was familiar with on the album was Tempted, obviously. If, if anybody that likes music should have at least known that song. Uh, that, that was a big, wasn't a big hit because it didn't really uh, do anything here in the U.S. It got airplay, but it never really uh, was too big uh, chart wise. But it was what broke them through here in America, obviously. Um, on the mainstream chart is where it mostly fell here. This album reached uh, as far as number nine, 49 in the U.S. only. Mm. Well, that was for that was for Tempted itself. And then the album itself was number 44. But that was, um, when I was looking back on here, I believe that was the um, first. So, Squeeze, East Side Story, came out in 1981. It was a follow-up to Argy Bargy. <laughs> what a name. Argy Argy Bargy. Argy, Argy, Bargy. Argy, Bargy is how it's pronounced. Argy Bargy? Yeah. Well, even weirder. I would have called it Argy Bargy because that's the way it sounds from spelling. Interesting. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, so this one came out uh, May of 1981. Hit number 19 in the UK. Number 44 in the US. And that was the second album to chart in the US for them but um and then obviously as far as singles go uh tempted 
is one of three and the first of three to ever chart on the U.S. singles chart, although it didn't make the top 40. It did come in at number 49. So surprisingly, because there's another song on this album that actually made the top five over in the U.K. Uh, labeled with love number five in the UK. So it just, it's just one of those classic cases of how it's weird how a certain song does so good in, you know, in one country and in another country, it's t totally different in some countries. It doesn't even chart at all. So you just, you just never know depending on yeah. the song. Yeah. Attempted well, I, would, I would think label with love would not have been, I mean, I don't know what, where you would have played that on us radio. Cause it's very country tinged. Yeah. It's probably on the mainstream, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you'd have played on a pop station, whereas I think I think Britain was probably a little more open-minded than the U.S. Yeah. at the time. <laughs> so, you know, so there you have it. I mean, Tempted um, is one of those great songs that, you know, will live on forever. And it's just weird that, like you said, they brought in Paul Carrick, and that was his first album there. And he, that's the only song he sings lead vocals on. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, he's keyboardist for... Um... Eric Clapton on his U.S. tours. I think he sings, I think he sings How Long during Clapton shows, but not all of them. Yeah. Well, but yeah, and he, and he was a keyboardist for uh, Roger Waters as well. So he's, he's an accomplished keyboardist. I mean, everybody knows his vocal work, but yeah, he's, he's also known for his keyboard playing. Right. And then that's what he was on, brought in really for on the album to begin with. Right. And I guess they probably just felt that his vocal styles were, were perfect for that tempted because and, that, and that's the one thing about this album that, um, you know, now that we're getting into the album here, it's very interesting. 14 tracks on it at all. Usually back then, back in the um, early 80s, you know, usually you'd average nine to 10 at most. So for yeah. them to put 14 on an album, that was uh, quite interesting there. Um, and the one thing that is uh, unique on this album is the way uh, the songs are. It's not like they're all rock or they're all this or they're all that. Very unique in the styling. It's got a variety of a little bit of everything, like you mentioned, with the country tinged stuff there of, you know, labeled with love, the the driving beat of Tempted. Um, you got a Piccadilly, which is a little bit more um, almost like a Brian Setzer ish type song in a way. You know, yeah, they got some bit, 50s yep. stuff in there. Yeah, Messed Around's another one like that. And then you got the lead off track in Quintessence, a song you'll never forget the name of it. You'll know exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about. I never even heard of it until you gave me this album. So, you know, <laughs> there you go right there. You know, I, I thought there was uh, and, and the and then did you even mention the song? There's no tomorrow, which is a very Beatlesque song. Yeah. Psychedelic kind of it definitely reminds you almost of like, you know, something that the Beatles would have done. It just, right. you know, so you got a, such a wide, wide variety of stuff here. And, and, there, and you, you know, you got obviously the leader, the lead guitar player and the main lead singer, Glenn Tilbrook there. And the other guitar player also took a turn on two of the tracks, which was uh, Chris Stilford, who played on something, someone else's heart in heaven. And obviously someone else's heart is definitely one of the standouts on the album too. It, it goes right after in, second song on the album. It kicks right in. So you got, in quintessence, someone else's heart, and then it goes right into tempted. So that's, that's a pretty solid start. Uh, I do like there's no tomorrow, like I mentioned. Um, trying to think of what other else there was one song on the other. I think it was someone else's bell. I think kind of was the one that stuck out stuck out for me out of the other that whole side side two. And, and like you, unfortunately, I was in in the same boat where I couldn't. Uh, I had a go through youtube and play all the songs with the commercials unfortunately so it does take away Awful. from the flow a little bit <laughs> but you know but overall i listened to it more than enough times though to really give it a fair estimation uh what is it something that i will go out and buy probably not because i already have tempted and, and that's the only song that i i mean I'm, maybe if i'll download someone else's heart i like that one a lot enough to download it you know, and they, um, there's no tomorrow, but for the most part, you know, it's only got about three or four solid, solid songs in my estimation where, you know, if it had like seven, then I would say, yeah, I would definitely go out and buy it. 
So in other words, it was a good pick, not a bad pick, but one that for me, just a little bit out of my wheelhouse, hmm. as opposed to where you had in your wheelhouse. Uh, this was a little bit out of my wheelhouse because, uh, I mean, I like variety. Don't get me wrong. You know, there's a lot of albums out there that have a lot of variety in them. But just for me, I think maybe, if, maybe uh, you know, it, there's a lot of differences in UK bands and American bands. And when somebody makes an album that has a lot of variety from the way these guys are from the UK, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people love that kind of stuff. I have a lot of friends that are really into a lot of these type bands that come from the UK. You know, most people know one or two good songs by them, but a lot of people really dig deeper into the albums and go deeper and know everything by these bands. I unfortunately never got the honor to see Squeeze. I would definitely like to. Yeah, yeah. great live band. Great live band. Yeah, I've never got to see them, but I uh, definitely would like to. Um, but you know, at this point in time, you know, you know, I would like, like, like I said, that's, that's my estimation on it. Not a bad album, but um, just one that I wouldn't rush right out and buy. That's all. Okay. All right. Well, we got, we got a challenge for next week. Should we pick the records now or should we uh, make, yeah, we should just surprise way? them on the next one? Because like you said, <laughs> well, like you said, we want to, we want to make sure that it's on available to you without having yeah. to go through YouTube and all that kind of stuff. And, we don't want that type of problem again. You got it. All right. Well, hey, thanks for listening here, here. If you got some album suggestions for us out there, there, send them to us. So we'll listen. Yeah. And we'll give you credit on the air. You Absolutely. Know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that Tom's got to give me an album every week or I got to give him one or, you know, Joe Blow from Kokomo could call, could, could write us and say, hey, give this one a listen and we'll give you the credit right on the air here. Not if your name's Joe Blow. No. <laughs> That's a horrible name. From Kokomo. What are the chances? Because my grandfather used to call me that. <laughs> How do you like that uh, one? Aruba, Bahama, come on, pretty mama. All right. Well, thanks.